All right. Good afternoon to you all. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And good afternoon to you all. My name is Sena Bujema Rong. I work with Hennepin Health. Thank you all for joining the webinar on maternal health and inclusive communication today. The webinar is presented by a collaboration of Minnesota health plans, including Blue Plus, Health Partners, Hennepin Health, I Am Care, Medica, South Country Health Alliance, You Care, and United Healthcare Group. These health plans are working to improve um, maternal and child health in Minnesota through implementation of the Healthy Start Performance Improvement Project, which is commonly called the PIP. And these PIPs are just mandated by CMS, which is the Centers for Medicaid Services, whereby all health plans across the US that serve Medicaid population are required to implement these projects. Among others, the PIPs are designed specifically to improve the quality of care, the quality of service, and health outcomes for Medicaid members. They also address serious health conditions for Medicaid members. The Healthy Start PIP, which is what brings us here today, it concentrates on improving services for pregnant people and infants, especially in areas exhibiting the most significant racial and um, ethnic disparities. Um, all of the health plans in this collaborative already had a lot of initiatives already going on to address health and um, maternal and child health. However, this PIP platform provides us the opportunity to synchronize our work, formalize it, and to partner in a way that we would all be just addressing statewide priorities. Um, some of the measures that we are trying to pursue in this project include timeliness measures for comotan childhood immunizations, well child visits, prenatal and postpartum care visits as well. So this webinar today will be recorded and it will be made available to you later on for viewing on Stratis Health website. And um, we will have an evaluation for you to complete at the end of today's presentation. And that evaluation will appear automatically at the end of the webinar. By completing the evaluation, you will receive a certificate of participation. And um, just want to let you know that during today's presentation, you may enter any questions that you have in the chat. My colleague, Nicole, will be helping us to monitor the chat. Um, and we would just urge you to direct all your questions to all participants rather than just to a single presenter also. Our presenter may stop throughout the presentation to answer some questions and we'll also allow time at the end of the question and answer session, um, at the end of the presentation to take some of your questions and answer, answer them. So with that said, I have the pleasure of introducing our fantastic presenter here, Haley Brickner, who identifies as she, her. Haley is um, the Health Equity Coordinator for Minnesota Medical Association, where she works to advance equity and address disparities in our state. Haley's work Ha, she has um, over 10 years of experience working in racial equity and inclusion spaces, and her work has emphasized strength and resilience-based methods of change in marginalized communities, especially in indigenous communities. Haley holds a, much, a bachelor's degree in business administration, a master's of educational leadership, a master of science in health promotion, and also an extensive experience in facilitating topics um, related to racial justice, diversity, and equity. So you would agree with me that we have the right person to tackle this very important topic that we're going to discuss today, which is maternal health and inclusive communication. Thank you, Haley, for being here. You can Great. take it off from here. Great, thank you so much for that um, welcome and introduction. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our webinar on inclusive communication and maternal health. Um, as they mentioned in my introduction, my name is Haley Brickner. 
I'm the health equity coordinator for the Minnesota Medical Association. I use she, her pronouns, and I am from the Anishinaabe tribe of Grand Portage, Minnesota. Um, as they also mentioned, just a, you can pop your questions into the chat. Um, we'll definitely have time for Q&A at the end. So, um, yep, just our um, colleague Nicole will be monitoring that. So uh, we only have an hour, so we won't take a break, but please feel free to care for yourself as needed. Um, and we will jump right in. We have a lot to cover. So um, what we're here to talk about today is inclusive communication or how we can use words and language in a way that makes people feel seen, valued, respected, safe, um, and cared for. So by the end of this hour, you'll be able to identify some best practices for using inclusive communication to support health equity. Um, you'll be able to describe how non-inclusive language contributes to health inequities. And you'll be able to recognize some um, commonly heard stigmatizing terminology and have some non-stigmatizing alternatives to replace them with. And throughout, I will uh, do my best to connect the dots for how this all relates specifically back to maternal health. So just a little bit of level setting so that we understand the health equity issue that we are facing in Minnesota in terms of maternal and infant health. Um, and we need to preface this whole conversation with the fact that racism, systemic racism, not race, is the cause of health inequities. And so by that, I mean that the health inequities that we see are symptoms of broader societal inequities. Um, and those broader societal inequities have a much greater influence on health outcomes than people's individual choices. Um, and so we just wanna state clearly and operate from the shared understanding uh, that systemic racism is the root um, cause of some of these inequities that we'll discuss. So in the US, the maternal mortality rate for black and indigenous birthing people um, rates are two to three times higher than for their white counterparts. Um, and the infant mortality rates for black and indigenous babies um, are also more than double. Um, so when we see numbers like this, there's a clear inequity, a clear disparity. Um, but we also might think, well, you know, that's not Minnesota. Um, Minnesota is one of the healthiest states in the nation. Um, you know, look at our numbers. Our birthing outcomes are better than the national average. For example, um, our pregnancy-related mortality ratio is half of the national average. That's a great statistic. Um, but that doesn't tell the whole story. And these statistics don't apply to everyone. So when we start to dig deeper and disaggregate this data by race and ethnicity, we see that Minnesota actually has some of the worst health disparities in the nation. Um, although we're the healthiest state, we have some of the biggest inequities. So for example, uh, due to systemic racism, US born black or African-American uh, pregnant people die during pregnancy, delivery, or the year post-delivery 2.8 times higher than uh, their white counterparts. And for indigenous uh, Minnesotans, it's um, they are dying at rates 8.1 times higher um, than, than their white counterparts in those areas. Uh, another way to look at the inequities here in Minnesota, um, Black Minnesotans represent 13% of the birthing population, but made up nearly 27% of pregnancy-associated deaths. And Indigenous Minnesotans represent just about 2% of the birthing population, but made up 12% of pregnancy-associated deaths. So again, clearly there's an inequity um, where Black and Indigenous birthing people are dying at a rate that far outstrips their share of the population. Um, and what's more tragic about these numbers is that an estimated 60 to 80% of those deaths are preventable. Um, and it's also important to note that these inequities exist regardless of socioeconomic um, status. So even when controlling for income, education, health insurance, um, all of the socioeconomic factors, these disparities still persist. 
Um, one interesting study um, out of California showed that the wealthiest Black woman is at a higher risk of maternal mortality than the least wealthy white woman. So it's not about income. Um, so there's definitely a much deeper and broader conversation that we can have about these statistics, um, but that would be another webinar entirely. Um, so for our purposes today, I just wanted to make sure that we have a shared understanding of systemic racism as the root cause and just sort of this high level understanding of the maternal and infant health inequities that we are working to address in Minnesota. Um, and how does this all tie into inclusive communication? Um, it does, I promise. Um, so to address these health inequities, we need to address the ingrained beliefs and systems that created the inequities in the first place and that allow them to continue. Um, and central to that work is an understanding of the dominant narrative and the language that we use to talk about people. Because our beliefs, our values, our biases are all reflected in the words that we use. And as a society, cultural norms and ways of thinking are also reflected in the language. So we can really tell a lot about how people are treated um, by the way society speaks about them. And language as we know is powerful. Um, words can either perpetuate racism or promote racial justice. Uh, they can either empower people or marginalize them and they can either reinforce harmful narratives or provide more inclusive ones. And we want to be um, on the side of inclusion, of course, and speak in ways that reflect that. And I do acknowledge that this work is challenging. So as we work to improve the way we talk about race and the way we talk about equity, it can feel like the environment is constantly shifting. The language is always evolving. Words are changing. Um, and despite our best intentions, we're not always sure of the right thing to say. Um, and so a lot of times that fear of saying something harmful causes us to not say anything at all. But, and we don't want to avoid talking about it, however, because these conversations are so important, um, you know, now more than ever. Another reason that words are so important um, is because despite the old saying about sticks and stones, words actually can hurt people. So a substantial body of research demonstrates that words have not only a deep psychological impact, but can affect us physically as well. Uh, so for example, studies show that hearing negative words activates the same regions of the brain associated with physical pain. So in that way, words actually do hurt. Um, negative words also trigger the release of hormones that cause both acute and long-term stress and anxiety. They're associated, hormones that are associated with um, negative impacts on physical and mental health. Um, we can see how harmful that would be, you know, not just to pregnant people, but all people. Um, and on the flip side, positive words can have just as profound an effect, improving energy, confidence, motivation, self-perception, cognitive function even and overall well-being. And this I share really just to emphasize that this is about much more than semantics. Um, it's about more than being politically correct or you know being woke, as they say. Um, it's about all the ways that health and well-being of actual people are impacted by words in a very real and scientifically measurable way. And we also know that communication is a clinical skill. So the ability to communicate effectively is a core competency for healthcare providers, and it's truly a hallmark of high quality care. So better patient provider communication leads to better outcomes, higher levels of adherence, more feelings of trust, and greater patient satisfaction. Um, interestingly, most complaints about healthcare providers are related to issues of communication, not clinical competency. And how this relates to health equity, again, is that there's evidence of racial inequities in patient provider communication, where providers are less likely to communicate important information to patients of color, 
They use less rapport building statements. They use faster speech and have shorter visits. And they tend to use more verbally dominant language when working with patients of color. Um, all of these are, which are in turn linked to disparities in adherence. So when it comes to talking about, um, when it comes to language, it's not just how we talk about uh, to people, it's equally important how we talk about people. So here are a few examples of how different terms have different effects on the way people are perceived and in turn, the way that they're treated. So re one study, researchers ran an experiment exploring the public's association with different terms commonly used to refer to older people um, or older adults. And they found that the terms senior and elderly were perceived as less competent, while the terms older person or older adult were seen as more competent. Uh, they also found that senior uh, was associated with things like being grumpy, lonely, and not able to use technology, whereas the term older adults was associated with being independent and having it all together. Another study of mental health professionals revealed that when presented with the term substance abuser versus person with a substance use disorder, the substance abuser was seen as needing punitive measures, while the person with a substance use disorder was seen as needing therapeutic measures. Um, and they also found that the substance abuser was perceived to be more culpable um, or to blame for their condition. Um, and keeping in mind, this is a study of highly trained mental health professionals, not just you know, the uninformed public. And one more unfortunately common example um, and one that disproportionately affects African-American people is the term sickler, which is still a widely used term for people who have sickle cell disease, which is um, an extremely painful genetic disorder. And research shows that the term sickler is associated with negative attitudes of physicians towards patients who have sickle cell disease. And that when the patient's chart contains the word sickler, providers are more likely to doubt the patient's level of pain, less likely to prescribe adequate pain management, and less likely to adhere to evidence-based guidelines uh, for acute care in the emergency department, just, just because of the word um, that is used in their chart. So we we can start to see how language impacts well-being, um, impacts the way people are treated, and how it can exacerbate health disparities. Um, so, you know, what can we do about it? Um, what we can do is we can use language purposefully and intentionally as a tool to advance racial equity and inclusion and to interrupt or disrupt you know, stereotypes when we hear them. Um, I do have to say that there's no one right way to say things. Um, different people have different preferred terms. There's no single authority on which term is correct. The context that we're speaking in needs to be considered. And again, language is always evolving. So we can't provide a definitive list of correct terms, um, but we can offer some key principles and best practices that you can follow. Um, as you work to use inclusive language. So the first uh, principle or best practice is person-centered language. And you've likely heard of person-first language, but we say person-centered um, because this differentiates between person-first and identity-first. Um, so person-first is where we're placing the person before the disability, disease, condition, or circumstance. Um, and this emphasizes that the person is not their condition, they are a person who has a condition, but it doesn't make them who they are. Identity first language um, differs in that it refers to individuals in a way that emphasizes what they consider to be a core part of their identity. Um, and that serves to dispel the notion that a certain identity is a negative characteristic or an unfortunate affliction. So a well-known example of that would be in the deaf community um, and also in the autistic community where people often prefer identity first language, not always, but often. Um, in all cases, we should defer to the terms um, preferred by the individuals who have the lived experience. 
And if you're not sure or haven't had a chance to ask them yet or find out, um, deferring to that person first language will typically be um, a good place to start. So in this day and age, this this may seem obvious. It's like, why am I even talking about person first language? We know this stuff already. Um, but in, and in certain settings, it is, you know, person first language is taught in most health professions programs. It's mandated by scholarly journals. Um, but there's a significant disconnect between academia um, and what people know they're supposed to do um, and clinical and, and practice and what actually happens. So unfortunately, using person-centered language is not the cultural norm in most practice settings, even today, which is why it still bears mentioning. Um, it's still common for patients to be referred to by their diagnosis. For example, the stroke patient, the epileptic, the diabetic, the addict, the quadriplegic. Um, and, you know, that may be a force of habit or it's just, you know, quicker and more efficient, but it also reflects the biases um, and it demonstrates a lack of respect for that person's humanity by reducing them to a medical condition. So here's a list of um, examples of some commonly used phrases and the person-centered alternatives that we can use. Um, we have created an inclusive communication guide, which I can link to at the end. Um, and that does have a much more extensive list and more in-depth explanations. Um, but for our purposes, I just highlighted a few common ones here. Um, you know, so a handicapped person, of course, is a person with a disability. Um, rather than mentally ill, we would want to say a person with a mental illness. Um, instead of drug addict, a person with a substance use disorder. Um, and I, I'll just point out that these terms don't always um, relate to a physical condition. It can be around circumstances they are experiencing as well. So, for example, rather than calling someone homeless, they are a person um, who is experiencing homelessness. Um, or rather than, you know, referring to someone as poor, a poor person, um, they're people with lower incomes. Principle or best practice number two is to use destigmatizing language and um, avoid avoid stigmatizing language and use strength based language. So stigmatizing language is language that assigns negative labels, stereotypes, judgment, or blame to people, um, and it implies that their condition or their circumstance is inherent rather than the result of root causes. Um, it may be intentional. Um, it may not be intentional, but either way, it's dehumanizing, um, it's harmful, and it does have real impacts on health equity. So stigmatizing language about people has been shown to influence public opinion, research, policy, and it's correlated with uh, lower support for evidence-based public health policies, and it's shown to interfere with effective interventions. So again, the way we speak about people has very real world implications beyond just hurt feelings. Um, and as we saw in the previous example, it also shows up in clinical settings um, and it's shown to negatively impact the attitudes of physicians towards the patient. Um, it impacts the decisions they make and ultimately the quality of care that they deliver. Um, patient or providers are more likely to have a negative attitude towards the patient when their chart includes stigmatizing language. And the reason that this is an equity issue is that stigmatizing language does not affect everyone equally. Um, an example of this is the fact that Black patients are two and a half times more likely to have a negative descriptor or stigmatizing language in their medical records. And the medical record is something that follows the patient. So stigmatizing language not only reflects the biases of the person who wrote it, but it also influences the attitudes and behaviors of future um, providers who read those notes. So in that way, bias is sort of propagated from one provider to another via the charts, um, you know, affecting patient care indefinitely. And these days with, you know, patients have easy access to their medical records via electronic health records. Um, and they can see, they can actually see the notes in their charts. 
So we can imagine how harmful it would be to see your providers, your healthcare providers having written negative notes about you, um, especially for individuals who likely have already experienced discrimination in the healthcare system. Um, so what providers can do instead is use strength-based language, um, which highlights the inherent strengths of that individual. So rather than expressing doubt or disapproval, they could offer compliments and approval, um, maybe even stating some positive qualities of the patient or expressing praise for their efforts rather than emphasizing how they're failing. Um, instead of portraying a patient as difficult, maybe they could minimize blame um, or state the reasons why a patient is unable to adhere to a certain treatment. And instead of using these stereotypes and dehumanizing words, they could use, you know, respectful and person-centered language. Um, and it's really, it's really simple. All those small changes could improve the, the care that the patient receives. Um, so this is another chart of just a few examples. Again, there's a much more extensive list in the Inclusive Communication Guide. Um, but these are some stigmatizing terms that we hear quite often and some alternative uh, terminology to continue or to consider. Um, you know, so for example, instead of calling someone disadvantaged, um, we could say they're experiencing disadvantage because of, and then state the reason. Um, Non-compliant is a big one. Um, rather than referring to somebody as non-compliant, um, we could say that they're unable to adhere because of, and then state the reason. Um, and so just kind of circling back to the maternal and infant health angle, um, the reason why all this matters is because when we're speaking, you know, to and about pregnant people, um, we're not referring to a homogenous group by any means. So this is just a little graphic that shows the diversity um, the diversity that we are interacting with when we interact with um, pregnant people, um, you know, so likely they hold at least one or maybe more marginalized identities. And so we can use a lot of these best practices um, as we work with patients um, from all different backgrounds. Um, so these are just a quick, I'm just going to kind of cruise through these actually. Um, so rather than saying, for example, the mother is diabetic, non-compliant with insulin, uninsured, um, a better way to say that would be that the childbearing parent is living with diabetes, she doesn't have insurance to cover insulin, so she has difficulty adhering to the recommended treatment. And you can just you can just under you can just get a sense of how much more respect for her humanity and her circumstances that second statement has. Yes, it may be a few words longer, um, but so what. Okay, and so moving on to principle three, this one is about being specific um, when talking about people and groups of people. Um, so really getting into respecting identities, calling people what they want to be called, um, and understanding what the terms we're using really mean so that we're being sure that we're using precise language. Um, so I'll, I'll just share one well-known example, um, which is BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C which stands for Black, Indigenous, People of Color. So BIPOC is a term that has actually been around for a while, but really came into mainstream use in 2020 with all of the increased focus on racial justice um, and the Black Lives Matter movement. And BIPOC is meant to acknowledge that Black and Indigenous peoples are more severely and brutally impacted by racism um, than other people of color in this country, both historically and currently. Um, and this is true, and it is important to acknowledge um, that Black and Indigenous communities still bear the impact of slavery and genocide, respectively. Um, and so their experience certainly has been different from other people of color. Um, but the issue with the term is that it's come to be used interchangeably with the term people of color, and it's used even when the issue at hand does not pertain to Black and Indigenous communities. Um, so not all conversations about race and equity should center Black and Indigenous peoples in the way that the term BIPOC does. Um, and the other issue with the term is that it can create sort of a hierarchy of discrimination 
um, where the experiences of other people of color may, you know, may feel like those are minimized. So we can see that taken at face value, BIPOC is a seemingly more inclusive term, but if we dig a little bit deeper, we can see how it can actually have the opposite effect of making people feel um, either lumped together or excluded or called out when the issue doesn't even apply to them. Um, and so it's just an example of how we want to understand what the term we're using actually means, because it's not that the term BIPOC is inherently wrong. It's just that we're usually not using it correctly, and we want to be intentional and precise with our words. Um, you know, to that end, when we describe groups of people, none of the blanket terms are perfect. There's really, you know, no one correct term that's agreed upon by everyone. There isn't a perfect acronym to describe people. Um, and that's just why we want to be specific um, whenever possible. So avoiding terms that lump multiple communities together. Um, sorry. Avoiding terms that lump multiple communities together, terms that erase important differences between groups, terms that center whiteness as the norm. Um, and of course, we want to use the terminology preferred by the individual or group. If you don't know, try to find out. We want to err on the side of inclusivity and just ensure that the terms we're using, we understand what they mean and use them in the correct context. Um, and so leading into principle four, we also want to think about intent versus impact. So while we may be well-intentioned in using the term, you know, BIPOC, for example, we need to understand that the impact maybe isn't what we think it is, and to really think carefully about the message we want to deliver. Um, so the fourth principle um, has to do with how we deliver messages, particularly if we're using data. Um, and so to introduce this principle, I want to um, preface it with an understanding of the dominant mental model or the mindset of the general public um, here in our country, in our context, because to offer a new narrative, we need to understand the current one. So in America, these are some of the defining values of our culture. Um, we believe in equality, we believe in fairness, everyone is given the same opportunity. Um, if you work hard enough, if you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, everyone can achieve the American dream. Um, and so because of these ingrained values, um, a dominant mental model in our society is individualism. And actually, we are individualistic to the extreme. Um, ranking number one in the world um, as far as individualism. So in terms of health, what this means is that most people believe that health comes down to individual choices. So whether someone is enjoying the benefits of good health or whether they're struggling with poor health, that's mostly due to their lifestyle and the personal choices that they make. So, you know, in certain circles, there is an understanding of the role of social drivers of health, the impact of systemic racism, um, and all those things. But for the average American on the street, the most prevalent belief is that individual health mostly comes down to individual choices. Um, and so, let's see, speaking of the average person on the street. Um, this is a survey I keep thinking that was conducted. Um, and this is what they have to say in response to the question, what shapes health? As health as like what you eat and your weight. We probably eat out too often. Smoking. Your diet. Drinking and stuff. Some families might like raise our kids on fast food. Nutrition. Exercise is important. Too much fat, too much starch. Food? What goes toward being healthy is what a person does. Himself. Health comes down to individual choice. Can't tell people what to eat. Boils down to the individual. Maybe every man for themselves. People are lazy. Well, I think on the individual level, everyone has to do their part. Everybody plays their part. Decisions people can make in their own lives. Grow your own vegetables. 
bicycles and green culture. Yes. Maybe like bike more, uh -huh. drive less. Be green ways to uh, to do things, I suppose. Anybody can make choices in their own life. And if you put enough plants uh, yeah. in your house, you can be breathing fresh air the majority of your time. And then you as an individual are the one who's going to make the choice. Get a Brita filter if you want clean water or something. And if they choose to make healthy choices, you know, fun, good for them. So we can hear that health individualism coming through pretty strongly. Um, we saw most people mention diet and exercise, um, but even those people who had a larger or who had an awareness of larger factors like environmental health, for example, they still said that it's up to the individual to come up with a solution. So poor water quality, get a filter. Poor air quality, buy some house plants. Um, need healthy food, just grow some vegetables. Um, need exercise, use a greenway. Um, as if it were all um, you know, up to the individual. Um, and that was just a snippet um, of the data that they collected. Um, but what they found is that overall, social drivers of health and the role of systems and policy and shaping health is almost entirely absent um, from people's thinking. So that was a little bit of a detour, but bringing it back again to inclusive communication. Um, the reason that I shared that is because we need to keep in mind that the default setting for American thinking on health is individualism. And so we need to craft our messages in a way, <clears throat> excuse me, that don't reinforce that dominant model and that offers an alternative, more inclusive narrative. And this is especially true when we're presenting data because numbers are powerful, um, they're impactful, and we often use numbers to provide um, evidence of health inequities. But depending on how they're presented, they can do more harm than good by triggering biases, reinforcing stereotypes, and perpetuating that narrative that health is about individual choices. So a few guidelines that we can follow um, or keep in mind, at least when using um, data to communicate about equity, um, is that first order matters. So although most of us were probably trained to start a presentation with your background data, um, in the context of health equity, we want to think, rethink that a little bit, um, because when we lead with data about the disparity, that's really the first impression, and they influence the reader. Um, so instead, we want to lead with information about the social, um, environmental, or systemic causes that contribute to the health inequity that we're presenting. Um, next, less is more. So it can be tempting to stack up a lot of statistics to emphasize the severity of a problem. Um, but providing too many facts and figures can be first intimidating and second, it doesn't leave enough space for people to reason through what each figure means. Um, so it's more important to get people thinking about why these disparities exist, how they're allowed to persist um, rather than just being bombarded with numbers. Um, so we don't wanna present numbers just because we have them. Um, but instead, be selective and use data to back up your statement about root causes rather than as the main point. Um, and similarly, the third um, guideline is to highlight causes, not outcomes. And so this means that we must we must attribute responsibility for the inequity. Um, we don't want to sound blamey, but if we don't specifically place the blame somewhere, People will fill it in for themselves, and that, as we saw, means blaming the individual. So we need to name explicitly the systems that are to blame and not leave any space for the idea that these inequities are due to individual choices. Um, and so we just make sure that we're highlighting the causes, um, which emphasizes the need to fix systems and not people. Um, and it's also great if you can include a practical solution in the statement that you're making um, and then use strengths-based language as well. So a couple examples of intent versus impact and how we can use framing to convey more inclusive messages. Um, so for example, you might say, the prevalence of obesity is higher in Hispanic or Latino Latina children than it is for white children. Your intent or what you hope this 
pe makes people think about is the social drivers of health um, that negatively impact this community. Um, however, the impacts or stereotypes that could potentially be triggered are, you know, that the parents don't care about their children's health or they let them do whatever they want. Um, and so a way that we could say this better is that the places where Hispanic and Latino Latina children live are less likely to offer access to healthy foods and safe places to exercise. This helps explain why the prevalence of obesity is higher in, in those children. So we can see it's just naming that cause rather than allowing blame to land on the people. Um, and here I wanted to provide real world examples um, to demonstrate the type of wording that actually is used in mainstream contexts, um, not just in hypothetical webinar examples. Um, so this is a direct quote from a credible Minnesota news source within the last few years. Um, and I'll just uh, let you skim that quickly. Um, another example of intent versus impact. You might say Native Americans have the highest prevalence of alcoholism and have lower utilization of treatment options. Your intent or what you're hoping to get people thinking about is substance use as a, a symptom of historical trauma, systemic oppression, forced assimilation. Um, but the impact or stereotypes that could unintentionally be triggered are, you know, Native Americans are more susceptible to alcoholism or they're genetically predisposed to it, which isn't true, um, or that they don't want to help themselves. Um, so a way that we could say it better is that there's a lack of culturally appropriate substance use treatment programs for indigenous peoples. Few programs have been funded, implemented, and evaluated. This helps explain why Native Americans have lower utilization of treatment programs. Um, and here again is another example of a real quote right from a credible Minnesota news source. Um, you know, it's a bunch of alarming numbers. Um, it emphasizes how bad, quote unquote, it is in Native communities, but it says nothing about the structural causes of this inequity, leaving people to wonder why Native American communities are even worse, quote unquote, than other marginalized communities. Um, and last, I just want to uplift a couple of examples. I'm gonna have to kind of breeze through so we have time. Um, Okay, here's one that's, so bringing it back to maternal health, um, you might say African-American women are two to three times more likely to experience premature birth and three times more likely to give birth to a low birth weight infant, even after controlling for socioeconomic factors. So what you hope they think, your intention is to raise the impact of racism um, in medicine on African-American uh, women are birthing people. But unintentionally, the impacts or stereotypes that could be triggered is that, you know, these people don't take as good of care of themselves um, as they should while they're pregnant, or it's because they don't have a healthy lifestyle. So a way to say this one better would be racism serves as a chronic source of stress, negatively affecting the body's hormonal levels, which can increase the likelihood of premature birth and low birth weights. This helps explain why African American women, and then it goes into the to the statistics. So we're not saying don't share the statistics. We're just saying make sure that we are placing, um, attributing blame or attributing responsibility um, where it's due. Um, and so this is just to uplift an example of um, a statement that really did it well or that got it right. Um, so this one says racism, not race, is the cause of racial health inequities. So this is really bringing it back to my very first slide um, that began with this exact phrase. Racism, not race, is the cause of health inequities for Black birthing people and their babies. Structural racism involves interconnected institutions created by the historical and ongoing devaluation of Black lives. Because of structural racism, and then you can go into the statistics, Black and Indigenous pe birthing people die two to three times as often, the babies die. Um, 
two times as often. So we can just really see the difference um, in the way that statement is crafted and versus some of those uh, previous examples. Um, so that being said, um, I just want to conclude with all of this information isn't intended to create shame or blame or make you scared or nervous about saying something wrong or to feel bad about things you might have said. It's definitely not the intention. Um, and if we do say something that's not inclusive, we can reflect on it, learn from it, apologize for it, and then identify how we can do better next time. So we're never going to speak perfectly um, or never say anything wrong, but how we approach it really matters. Um, and that being said, it's really our own responsibility to think about the words that we use um, and the impact that they have to stay up to date as much as possible um, and to just do our best to use words that uplift and empower people um, rather than marginalize and harm them. So whether that's informally in the conversations you have or more formally, like if you're creating a resource or giving a presentation or drafting policy or writing articles or speaking with patients or speaking with colleagues, um, there's so many different areas that this applies. Um, and finally, um, if you're a leader or if you're in a position of power, you have an important role to play in advancing equitable and inclusive language um, through your own communications and through making sure it's institutionalized in your organization. Um, so that's what I have for you. The last note, again, I mentioned this inclusive communication guide, um, mentioned it a couple of times. That is a free resource that we developed. Um, and that lives on the Minnesota Medical Association Health Equity page, which I'll um, link to in the chat once I stop screen sharing. Um, but this is a tool that we developed for physicians, or but also for anyone who works in healthcare um, that you can use to be more mindful and educated about the language that you're using um, when we're talking about equity. Um, so this can be referred to for additional guidance um, if needed. So that's available to you as well. Um, I don't think I have time for this. Also on our health equity page, you'll just see more resources and workshops that we offer. So feel free to peruse. I will link that as well. And I will stop sharing, I think, and open it for questions. A couple of great comments came from the chat. One that stated that language is important and, uh, she was hoping that one day speakers will refrain from saying you guys when addressing a group that includes women and men. Male is not the default and it's important that we all feel included, which I think is always a great reminder. And then um, as you were listing examples, um, someone else added another example um, of how sometimes when we're talking about patients, we think of the term non-compliant seen in patient charting and how it's said to patients, particularly those where English is not their first language or are an immigrant. There is a communication barrier that impacts how um, a patient adheres to medical advice. And I think that's a great reminder for, for all of us. Yeah, um, and to both of those comments, I, I know that this um, presentation does emphasize heavily the racial and ethnic um, health inequities and disparities. Um, but to the point about you know the gender and the um, the status, the language that they speak, um, you know, there's definitely um, uh, this applies to that as well because there's of course inequities in those areas as well. So. Um, don't want to minimize that with this presentation, but um, but yeah, I definitely agree with both of those comments. Thank you. Someone had a suggestion of maybe saying you people to address everybody respectfully instead of you guys. So mm -hmm. y'all. <laughs> Another good one. <laughs> or like, hey friends, or anything. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you guys, you know, that centering maleness the same way that a lot of words that we use center, you know, whiteness or all, it's just about, you know, whose perspective are we, whose perspective are we considering, whose perspective are we thinking from and whose is being, you know, ignored. 
Another question just came in and it says, as we see inclusive communication can sometimes be more complex or inefficient. How can we balance the attention to social justice and cognitive load? I think it becomes, it's a good question. And I think it becomes a habit um, because if you do have to think through each thing in the moment, it does take more time and it does take more cognitive effort. Um, and that's why implicit bias is so common in healthcare settings, because if you're working, you know, fast paced um, environment, um, emotional environment, high stress, you're likely to just sort of default to those less inclusive ways just because that because it's habit. So I think by through practice and through repetition, eventually your brain can create, you know, the wonderful thing about our brain is that it can create those new pathways to where, you know, calling someone a person with diabetes just becomes the instinct versus calling someone a diabetic, you know, and maybe it takes two seconds longer, but, you know, at what cost, if you're making that person feel more like a human, more respected, um, it's worth, you know, the practice in those extra couple of seconds. Have there been any more terms um, around birthing persons coming out, referencing parents, partners, et cetera, in maternal health? That's a really good question. And I I was kind of hoping someone to bring it up. That's not, I don't know a lot about it, which is why I didn't speak about it. I do know that um, as far as like gender inclusivity, yeah, it is becoming more common to say things like, you know, birthing person or childbearing parent or chest feeding versus breastfeeding. Um, so I think there is a lot more of that coming out so that we're inclusive of people who don't necessarily identify as a woman um, or who don't identify as a mother. Um, I'm not sure on at this point what the sort of like best practices around that. So that's something I'll, I'll also look forward to learning more about. Oh, here's some example. Yeah, if anyone else has examples of that that they use or that work well, um, you know, putting those in the chat. Um, I do know that asking people how they prefer, you know, because you also at the same time, some people want to be called mom or mother. Like they, you know, they they have value in that. So just asking people um, how they prefer to be called is usually a great place to start. Yep. So y'all can see in the chat. There's a. Uh, several examples of that coming through. Yeah, gender is a huge, yeah. I mean, it's almost an entirely separate presentation on gender. Like we could definitely talk um, for an hour just about that alone. So I appreciate y'all y'all raising these. Um, and the link that I just dropped is just to our health equity page. So that has the inclusive communication guide that I mentioned um, and just a bunch of other resources that we offer. Are there any other um, questions or comments? I really appreciate this feedback. So I think, Zainabu, did you have something to share? No, nope, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I was I was just gonna pull your your slide back up with your um your links. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Haley. And um. I don't think I see any more questions on the chat here. That was really a great presentation. Thank you so much for this. And um, thank you all for participating as well. And just to say again that um, the evaluation um, has been shared in the link and um, it's in the chat here, there. So you can complete the evaluation um, and send it back here, we'll get it automatically. And by completing that, you will be able to receive um, a certificate of participation once the evaluation comes through.
we also just want to remind you, as you can see there, we do have the recordings. The, 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 um, the webinar was recorded and it would be uploaded on the Stratis Health webpage that's given there. The website address has also been dropped in the chat. So you would be able to access this recording as well as recordings of other webinars that we've had in the past and look, watch out for upcoming ones as well through that website. So once again, unless we have any other um, oh, sorry, the last thing I just forgot yes. to mention, uh, sorry, was mm -hmm. that um, if you were interested in getting CME, um, I put my email address in the chat and you can email me for your CME certificate. Um, this was worth one um, unit. So if you're interested or if you want to reach out about anything else, my email is in the chat. Sorry, that's all. And just to add on to that, um, for CEU, we just encourage participants, if you would want CEUs for this, you should contact your relevant licensing boards to determine if this program will meet continuing education requirements as well. So um, once again, thank you all for participating in this webinar, and we look forward to seeing you in subsequent ones. Thank you, Haley. Thank you all. Have a great day. Yep.